The site of this humble salvage yard here on 4th Street near downtown Reno has a fascinating history. This location was the site in 1910 of the fight of the century. Jack Johnson and Jim Jeffries squared off here in their immortal bout. Immortal indeed, because we're still talking about it 113 years later. Let me walk you through that incredible day when the eyes of the nation were on a hastily built boxing arena in then Little Reno, Nevada. Like every other country around the world, the U.S. has certainly had its share of racial tensions. And our share was brought to the main stage of public consciousness in 1910 with the pitting of a former heavyweight champion who was white uh, against the reigning heavyweight champ who was black. Jim Jeffries started his professional boxing career at the age of 20. And in 1899 in Brooklyn, New York, he knocked out Bob Fitzsimmons to become the heavyweight champion of the world. He spent several years defending his title and gained a reputation for being able to take a tremendous beating and yet still come out on top. Jeffries retired in 1904 as the undefeated heavyweight champ and already was a legend in his own time. Jack Johnson, nicknamed the Galveston Giant, started his professional boxing career in 1898. He became the world colored heavyweight champion in 1903, and yes, there was that designation 120 years ago. He had ambitions to be the unracially qualified champion, but at the time, James Jeffries, who held that title, refused to fight Johnson and chose to retire instead. Johnson finally became the heavyweight champion of the world in 1908 when he defeated Canadian Tommy Burns in Australia. This made Jack Johnson the first black heavyweight champion of the world. Due to the fact that a black man was the reigning champion of a much revered sport, there was a contingent of white America that just wasn't down with that. And they called for a great white hope that would take the title back away from Jack Johnson. Jim Jeffries uh, was not initially interested in this hypothetical matchup. Uh, he was retired and actually doing quite well as a alfalfa farmer in Burbank, California. However, the press kept badgering him and promoters waved dollar signs in front of his eyes uh, until he finally agreed and came out of retirement and announced that I am going into this fight for the sole purpose of proving that a white man is better than a Negro. This was 113 years ago, folks. Jim Jeffries was way out of shape after a six year layoff. He weighed 330 pounds and in a short amount of time, he had to shed 104 pounds to get down to his fighting weight of 226. When the fight was arranged, Jack Johnson was already in prime fighting condition. Jeffries set up his training camp at this location, which was then known as Moana Springs, a complex that was opened in 1905. Uh, back in the day, Moana Springs was a resort and a uh, vibrant cultural location in Reno. And at one time there was a large geothermally heated pool covered with a big bathhouse here. Uh, there was also a lake excavated for, for boating. There was a dance hall. There were sports fields. There was trap shooting here. And they also hosted boxing matches. Today, a new 52,000 square foot aquatics and fitness complex is being built on the site and it's scheduled to be completed in the summer of 2024. Jack Johnson set up his training camp at this location, which was back then known as Rick's Resort, which was located west of town on the old Verdi Road, which today is Mayberry Avenue. Jim Jeffries, during his training period and his, his weight loss, uh, kept a fairly low pro profile and uh, out of the public eye, but uh, Jack Johnson relished the spotlight and he appreciated the attention of the press and the community. In 1922, Rick's Resort was acquired by William Graham and James McKay, a couple of quasi mobsters who we actually highlighted in our Outlaw Gentleman episode previously. They, uh, they came in and uh, remodeled the entire place and renamed it the Willows. And during the pro prohibition years, the Willows was the go-to place for opulent dining and gambling and entertainment. The Willows burned to the ground in 1932 and was never rebuilt. 
Today, this marker, which was installed in 2010, is the only reminder that these facilities were here. And today, this is just a residential neighborhood. Once the fight was agreed upon, both camps agreed on the retention of famed boxing promoter Tex Rickard, who had already signed Jeffries to a personal contract. The bout was initially supposed to happen in San Francisco, but the then California governor put the kibosh on those plans and a new venue was needed. The city of Reno lobbied hard to get the fight brought to Reno, and they were able to convince Tex Rickard that the, the town and an appropriate boxing facility would be ready in two weeks. The city had to prep the entire town, and more importantly, had to build an appropriate boxing venue in just two weeks. Large construction crews labored here for long days on what was then a vacant lot in the sagebrush just east of Reno on 4th Street. Their mission was to build a boxing arena that would hold 20,000 spectators. The event itself attracted 30,000 people to Reno as this was the most uh, publicized sporting event in the country at that time. Tex Rickard, the promoter, ended up being the referee for the bout, although he had never previously refereed a boxing match. A purse of $101,000 was going to be split 75% to the winner, 25% to the loser, and the boxers, boxers would also uh, get a cut of the revenue of the fight film, which was recorded that day with nine cameras. On the morning of July 4th, spectators made their way over to the hastily built boxing venue, and many used the streetcar system that was in use along 4th Street at that time. The temperature was well over 100 degrees by the time the fight started. There was intense wagering for this fight, with the odds easily favoring Jeffries. Racial tensions surrounded this spectacle, and so to protect the fighters, guns were prohibited in the arena, Alcohol was prohibited and not sold. Even apples were banned as potential projectiles. As the reigning champion, Jack Johnson entered the ring first, just before 1 p.m. on July 4th, 1910, for a fight that was scheduled for 45 three-minute rounds. In the early rounds, the fighters kind of sized each other up and uh, felt their way into the fight, but very soon, Johnson began dominating, and Jim Jeffrey started to wither from Jack Johnson's constant barrage and also from the intense heat. Jim Jeffries had entered that ring as the undefeated former heavyweight champion of the world who had never been knocked down once. That was not to remain the pattern for this fight. In the 15th round, Jack Johnson knocked Jim Jeffries down for the first time in Jeffries' career. Jim Jeffries was able to get back on his feet, but Johnson again put him down on the canvas. Jeffries again got to his feet, but his corner saw the writing on the wall, and they threw in the towel to stop the bout to save Jeffries the humiliation of being knocked out. So Jack Johnson remained the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world with a technical knockout. John L. Sullivan was a boxing megastar in this era, and he was the first heavyweight champion of gloved boxing. This is how John L. Sullivan broke down the fight to the New York Times. The fight of the century is over, and a black man is the undisputed champion of the world. It was a poor fight as fights go, this less than 15 round affair between James J. Jeffries and Jack Johnson. Scarcely has there ever been a championship contest that was so one-sided. All of Jeffries' much vaunted condition amounted to nothing. He wasn't in it from the first bell tap to the last. The Negro had few friends, but there was little demonstration against him. Spectators could not help but admire Johnson because he's the type of prize fighter that is admired by sportsmen. He played fairly at all times and fought fairly. What a crafty, powerful, cunning left hand Johnson has. He is one of the craftiest, cunningest boxers that ever stepped into the ring. They both fought closely all during the 15 rounds. It was just the sort of fight that Jeffries wanted. There was no running or ducking like Corbett did with me in New Orleans in 1892. Jeffries did not miss so many blows because he hardly started any. Johnson was on top of him the whole time. Johnson didn't get gay at all with Jeffries in the beginning, and it was always the white man who clinched, 
But Johnson was very careful, and he backed away and took no chances, and was good-natured with it all. The best man won, and I was one of the first to congratulate him, and also one of the first to extend my heartfelt sympathy to the beaten man. The news that Jeffries was beaten in the fight spread like wildfire across the country, and race riots sprung up that evening on the 4th of July, and reportedly 20 people were killed and hundreds more were injured in violence that uh, uh, creeped up in 50 cities across the country. Jack Johnson would continue fighting for many years. He only fought white fighters for five years after the Jeffries fight because he believed he could make more money than he could fighting black men. He finally lost his title after being knocked out by Jess Willard in Havana, Cuba in 1915. He continued to fight professionally until he was 60 years old in 1938. He was married three times, each time to white women, and the press wrote him for his celebrity lifestyle and interracial marriages. He was arrested a couple of times for violation of the Mann Act, which prohibited the transportation of women across state lines for immoral purposes, and this was enacted as a tool against prostitution. He was convicted in 1913 by an all-white jury and sentenced to a year in jail. He jumped bail and fled to Canada and for the next seven years, he lived abroad in several different countries. In 1920, he returned to the U.S. and surrendered, and he served out 10 months of his sentence at Leavenworth. One night in 1946, Jack Johnson uh, tried to eat at a segregated diner in North Carolina. When he was refused service, he drove away agitated and unfortunately struck a telephone pole and he passed away later that day from his injuries. He's buried in Graceland Cemetery in Chicago next to his first wife, Etta. On a side note, one of the coolest things that Donald Trump, love him or hate him, one of the coolest things that Trump did as president was his issuance of a full presidential pardon for Jack Johnson, which posthumously vacated his conviction. Uh, at the urging of actor Sylvester Stallone and uh, bo uh, boxer Lennox Lewis and members of Jack Johnson's family, uh, Trump signed this decree in 2018. Uh, this matter of uh, a pardon was brought up in the previous two administrations of, of Bush and Obama, but neither of those administrations got it done. Trump did the right thing here. Jim Jeffries was humbled by the loss and later did boxing training and promoted boxing matches in a barn on his alfalfa ranch in Burbank, California, which became known as Jeffries Barn. Thursday night matches were held in the barn for 22 years. This barn was later dismantled and moved, where it can be seen today at Knott's Berry Farm as the Wilderness Dance Hall. Jeffries died in 1953 after suffering a stroke seven years earlier. He is interred at Inglewood Park Cemetery in Inglewood, California. All right, I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about what was probably Reno's greatest and most significant sporting event ever. Uh, we're here at Lead Dog Brewing today in uh, uh, the brewery district of Reno on 4th Street. And today I'm having a Mertzen. Uh, they call it sweater weather. Uh, a Mertzen is a German style of beer that uh, is very malty and uh, was tra traditionally made in the spring, uh, in March. Mertzen is, is March in German, and it was uh, aged or lagered uh, during the summer months. If you'd like to get a little more into the story of uh, uh, Jack Johnson, I highly recommend a documentary by uh, Ken Burns, who's my, my favorite go-to uh, doc maker. Uh, it's called The Unforgivable Blackness, uh, The Rise and Fall of Jack Johnson. Uh, I think he made it in 2005. It's a great watch. It, it, it's really good, if for no other reason, because frickin' Ken Burns made it. <laughs> if you haven't already subscribed, please click that little subscribe button. It just lets you know when I put ma new material out into the wild. And if you'd also bop that little like button, uh, that just tells the YouTube algorithm that you're here and you dug it, and it helps uh, the video to be seen by more people. All right, so. As Harold S. Smith Sr. of Harold's Club always said, I'm with you. Cheers.